And it was all done by design. This is not uh, an accident, you know. The clown was purposefully injected into Western media in the 1800s through the theatre by Freemasons, okay? It was done specifically as a means to make people openly worship demons without realising it, you know? And you can look at all clown symbolism throughout circuses, especially going into the 19th and 20th century, with there were all Freemason-run affairs. Freemasons own the industry today. All the Shriners still own the circuses now and have the biggest travelling circus, you know, in America. Um, and they always have bro, as you can see here next to the old posters, the Cole Bros Circus. Bro, brother, is not because they were just brothers, they were related to each other, okay? A brother is a member of the fraternity. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast, and I'm your host, the Sensible Hippie. Today, we have a very special guest that I'm incredibly excited to introduce to all of you, Paul Stubbs. Paul is a renowned YouTuber known for his groundbreaking and thought-provoking theory that Nephilim resembles what we today recognize as clowns. In today's episode, Paul is going to take us down that rabbit hole, exploring connections between myths, legends, and eerie depictions of clowns throughout history. We'll delve into the evidence, the controversies, and the fascinating intersections of ancient texts and the modern day interpretation that fuel Paul's theories. While you can always enjoy these episodes through audio, I strongly recommend watching this one on YouTube or Rumble. We've got a lot of visual content that will greatly enhance your experience and understanding today's topic. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Aloha, Paul. Thank you for coming on the show. Your theory in connecting clowns to Nephilim is quite fascinating and very unique. I wanted to ask what initially sparked this connection for you and how did you begin this journey in such a specific and distinct area of research? <laughs> that's, that's a very good way to describe it, to be honest. Yeah, it's specific and distinct. Um, well, t to preface, you know, I didn't, I didn't think I would end up being somebody who would talk about clowns so much. I'm not really like a a, a huge enthusiast, exactly. Um, to be honest, I never really gave something like a clown a second thought in my entire life. You know, they've never been anything on my radar, exactly. Um, but there was this thing in 2016 called, you know, the, the creepy clown sightings event where people were standing menacingly on street corners, scaring people, you know, and, and the whole media was a flurry about pointing this out to everybody and saying, do you see the creepy clowns? They're coming for your kids, you know, and a, a frenzy was kind of stirred up in that time period in 2016 in October. And, um, people were, were genuinely scared that they were going to bump into a, a creepy clown you know and people were obviously joining in on the hype dressing up like clowns and kind of snowballing the effect a little bit and by that point in my life you know I'd, I'd been um, researching the occult and biblical history and conspiracy theories you know for, for at least about maybe four four years by that point probably longer about five or six years maybe I have my own channel called understanding conspiracy and I was kind of swimming in just researching everything to do with that and when I saw the um you know, the creepy clown sightings on TV, I, I instinctively knew that, well, the media doesn't show you anything unless they want you to see it. And usually whatever you see on TV is, is a symbol of some kind for the initiated to take some information from. So I knew immediately then, okay, so the clown means something. It's a symbol for something, you know. And uh, things kind of came together in my mind which sent me on the track of study for where I am today because because of past experiences. You see, I, I kind of grew up in the psychedelic new age side of existence. You know, I was, um, I was in the heavenly, in that realm of consciousness exploration, shall we call it. And I was experimenting with all kinds of uh, entheogens to, to try and explore these realms. Um, I was heavily listening to people like Terence McKenna and every single thing he's ever done, you know. And uh, I, I was always looking for more, always trying to find 
new experiences and new realms and to connect with these other dimensions because I've just always just been an inquisitive mind and um this was you know th- for the best part of being 16 to like 20 22 23 is what I was when I was doing all this stuff and I was never like I wouldn't call myself like um you know a new age hippie exactly you know I was never into like chakra alignments or crystals or that type of thing personally I was more focusing highly on the philosophical spiritual aspects of consciousness you know what what is that exactly and what what does it mean to exist in a way i guess i was looking for god <laughs> you know if you can describe it as anything and so during those those years of my life i did see some things you know i did understand that okay so there is a spiritual realm what people call the astral realm or well there's many names for that the fractal matrix whatever you want to call it you know the warp to our wolf of existence and I always knew that existed, <laughs> but when I when I came out of my university degree, so I have a degree in fine art, you know, I, I was at a point in my life where I didn't really know where I was going, I didn't really have much direction. I had created this YouTube channel um, based on exploring conspiracy theories. I was very much directionless looking for answers still, even after all my consciousness exploration stuff, and... Uh, I decided to go down the Christian routes to try and explain the conspiracy of the world, and I found all my answers there. And I eventually gave myself over to God and, and you know, started to follow that path. And that's when I started to do my real deep dive in 2014 onwards into biblical history. And I, I quit all the stuff I used to do then. You know, I didn't explore consciousness using drugs anymore or anything like that. I, I went completely sober, and I... I I focus solely on the word and try to understand reality through that perspective. And I was getting answers. And I also began to understand the spirit realm a lot more and what it means to be involved in spiritual warfare. And as as, as a result, I kind of, um, well, how do I explain this? So I did a lot of studies into the Nephilim specifically. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. And this is where kind of I, I just, discovered more about the aesthetics of the nephilim because i was always seeing these images of like giants you know everywhere that people had drawn to try and talk about the nephilim and they were always like really tall tanned looking huge pectoral muscles conan the barbarian style human looking things you know with loincloths and clubs or something and that just never sat right with me as an artist, you know, and as somebody who, be, who was studying the scriptures and, and the information I could find on what the Nephilim looked like and looking at experiences, having these experiences in the spirit realm with these drugs and, you know, seeing these entities and these things, I knew they wouldn't have looked like humans. I just knew that was the case. What would they have looked like? So that was just something always in the back of my mind, always speculating, what would these things have looked like? Because they were supposed to be the hybrids between fallen watcher angels and humans seraphim class angels specifically and seraphim is is its root words in hebrew is a fiery flying serpent so these things weren't exactly human looking you know dragons more akin to mixing with a human what would that look like what would that kind of hybrid look like you know and that had always been there when i did decide obviously to give myself over to christ and go down that route um, I did start getting heavily demonically attacked as well, which is why the whole spiritual warfare aspect of things was very important to me. I started having sleep paralysis, um, visions of psychedelic demon jester monsters. Um, I had a Hatman encounter where I thought I was being murdered in my dream by this guy, you know, and um, I had one moment in waking life where I just, my brain started to shut off and my body started to break down and I had to call in the name of Jesus Christ to save me and he did in an instant. And all of these things were proving to me, okay, so there's a spirit realm and there are negative entities on the other side that clearly one was dead. And me dis- me kind of leaving behind that life of consciousness exploration seems to have triggered them in some way to come after me. And we'll get into today the nature of demons and why this is the case. But uh, all of those experiences amalgamated with this moment in 2016 with the clown sightings. And it became clear to me there's something to do with clowns and demons. And the reason they're showing them on TV right now is they're saying something like the Nephilim are returning or something like that. You know, people are going to start seeing things that look like clowns. So I I kind of just rolled with that idea and I looked out there into the world to see if anybody has ever connected the two words, Nephilim and clown. 
And no, not in an official capacity. No one's ever really looked into it like that. No one's ever considered the two to be related in any way. Um, but there's something in my mind that I knew. There's something here. There's something to do with demons, and there's something to do with clowns. And there's, and I know that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. So there's a connection there in some way. And here I am, you know, eight years later, writing the book on the subject with the 43 episode series dedicated to it. And it turns out, yes, the Nephilim did look like clowns. So maybe we, we can get into that today. But that's basically a summary of what started my thought process into all of this. It's a, it was a long journey over many years, but it's, a, it's an odd one. But here I am. Yeah, that's crazy how you connected the two. I would have never connected that. So that's that's pretty amazing. And I've heard your uh, interviews and other podcasts. And I think I seen one where you actually showed uh, the, the, the photos. And it's amazingly similar to clowns. So I'd love to get into that. And that's really convincing when you get to see photos. Oh, sorry, could you just repeat that? It just it just cut out when you started I speaking. Know. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the whole thing? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been <laughs> it's been cutting out like that even on you a little bit. That's I hate you know, I don't understand why, but sometimes if there's bad weather, it seems like Riverside and I think Zoom, Zoom too, it kind of freezes. Is it um do you have bad weather on your side? Oops, there you you're go. frozen. We're, we're back again. <laughs> I'm I've I've got you again. Um I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's never, I've never had a stream where something like this didn't go happen. So don't worry about it. I'm used to this, but uh, we'll, we'll power through and we'll see what we can do. But you said um, yeah. you saw something specific that really got your attention originally. And then yeah, with your, um, with listening to one of your podcasts or something I saw and you had actual photos that you yeah. were showing. And boy, that really makes the connection when you're able to, to show. Because when you're telling people, you know, like, their gestures and they have stripes and things like that. You, you, I don't know. For me, it's hard for me to picture these things sometimes. And then when you showed it, and I mm -hmm. saw it, I'm like, whoa, you're right. Yeah. I never, you never put those things together. It's, it's visual is important. It is a very visual theory. Yes, because yeah. most of my most of my work isn't really necessarily about uh, clowns exactly. It, or <laughs> right. you know, it's not really it's not really rooted in the things that have been written down about Nephilim exactly. It's, it's a very visual thing because we have evidences for what they would have looked like from cultures who still have practices based on the religions they created when they were around. So you find that a lot of cultures around the world who have ancestor spirit worship traditions, well, they dress like what they call their ancient gods or ancestors. And that is actually a reflection of the Nephilim. That's what they're actually dressing like when you look into their histories. So you can look at the styles of dress all these cultures have and you can infer the features the Nephilim would have had. And it's a common theme across across the earth. It's white skin. You know, they white up the face with chalk paint of some kind. They add polka dot patterns or multicolored fractal patterns to the skin with multicolored paint. Uh, they often read the nose up as well, which is an odd feature, or add polka dots to the body. And they were a, a huge red feathered headdress of some kind, we're all made of straw perhaps, or they all have their own cultural specific way of doing it, their own artistic flair, but it's, it's the common aesthetical themes that weave throughout them all that shows that the Nephilim did have features you could equate to a modern clown. And again, as a lot of my work actually looked into, it turns out a modern clown is very much based after a specific demon called the Rakshasa from India. And even before that, all throughout medieval Europe, it was modelled after the wild man tradition, which was all through Europe as well. So they are quite literally historically documented. Uh, clowns, as we know them in the West as performers on stage, are very literally modeled after demons it's not even like a hidden thing if you look into it and i've uncovered a lot more about the rakshasa angle more so than the um the already well understood wild man angle for harlequin uh, but what my work has uncovered is that it's, it's very clear they've basically stolen the the costume of a rakshasa demon from thailand tem temples and dressed the first clown like that in the 1800s um so yeah very quite Literally, clowns are modelled after demons. But um, if you want to go into the history of the Nephilim themselves, you know they had features which were clownish. So that's kind of the theory in a nutshell. 
Yeah, I'd like to go down that rabbit hole. Sure. Sure. Well, I've got a, I've got a whole collection of images we can go through. Um, maybe maybe because this is quite different from most of my other podcasts, I talk about this quite a lot, to be honest. And I've talked about the histories and, and I give you a brief overview there as well. But maybe for fun, we could just today, we'll go through a collection of photographs I've kind of compiled and we can talk about the things as we go through them and we can kind of discuss the, the what I'm showing exactly and what the visuals of what this theory is, sure. So let me just find, um, I have a file called Top Examples of Nephilim, which I sent to somebody in the past um, for them to use as background images. So maybe we can start with this one first and then we'll just go through them and I'll discuss a few things as, as we go along that I've discovered. And uh, maybe then we can, if you want to ask any questions, stop me along the way please feel free. Um, so I'll just very quickly get this ready and I will just share the screen as well. So, right. There we go. And I'm just going to, have to share the screen with these guys. So share entire screen. Okay. So you can see my screen there now, can't you, I believe? Um, yeah, it's, it's got like screens and yeah. screens and screens. <laughs> Do yeah, you see that's that? About, okay. That's about to disappear. <laughs> there we go. So oh, okay. um, you can see this compilation of images now, can't you, I believe. Um, we'll just get that up there. And let me just check something on my end. Perfect. Right. So oh, well, there we go. So what you're looking at here is actually a typical Rakshasa demon. This is an Indian, an Indian uh, creation. Rakshasas are a part of a pantheon of, of demonic uh, negative entities in the Hindu religion. And um, you also have the counterpart cousins, you could call them Asuras, which are kind of look the same, but supposedly more the positive aspect towards the negative. Um, these were basically the bad guys of most of the, uh, the mythologies of Hindu, Hinduism. And quintessentially, they were giant, cannibalistic, tyrannical kings and rulers. They were quintessential Nephilim creatures, basically. And you'll find all throughout the, the, the Indic regions where Hinduism had its influence, and they all have their own cultural specific stories dedicated to these entities called the Rakshasas. But as you can see here, the, the base of a Rakshasa was pale white skin, wild bulging eyes, a very large red lipped a smiling mouth, sharp, jagged teeth. Now, this is uh, the base of any clown, if you can just go off the words alone. And this is what Joseph Grimaldi and his uh, costumes were initially based off of. Uh, so if we just uh, start from the beginning, though, and I'll just I'll scroll through some examples. So this is um, through China. And we have these generals. These are representing the spirits of the ancient generals, their ancestors again. Comes with the typical clown slit, the red mouth, the, the, the black and white skin with the multicolored patterns. Um, you can see here as well, this is another pale skinned demon from China. Um, very similar to the Rakshasas of India, the same buck tooth, red lipped motif with pale white skin and the tongue sticking out. That's another very common motif we see. And there's nothing quite as cheeky as a clown with, with his tongue sticking out, you know. So uh, I think there's definitely a link there. <clears throat> this is the Wangina of Australia. These are rain bringing gods um, who quintessentially are always depicted as looking like a pretty, pretty much a Western clown. A uh, big red afro, pale white skin, large red eyes. It looks like a ruff around the neck and polka dot patterned with black pom-pom buttoned top. But those uh, drops you see on the body there are actually supposed to represent raindrops. And these were these were ethereal entities that brought rain um, subsequently. And there were also kind of thunder gods as well. You'll find actually on any any content you go to where Nephilim are kind of discussed as, as, as mystical creatures, they're always associated with thunder, thunder and lightning and rain. It's very common. It's almost though like they can control the weather in many aspects. But this is quintessentially a clown by a Western standard, you know, and this is in the Kim an isolated Kimberley region of the outback of Australia, you know, and they just, they describe things like the rainbow serpents uh, building their, their land with their bodies and then these these are like an offspring version of the rainbow serpent that came and interacted with humans and taught humans how to build civilization. That just sounds like the Nephilim to me. Ancient rulers, ancestor spirits, builders of the of the kings and rulers of the antediluvian past, you know, that showed mankind things they shouldn't really be uh, be knowing. Well the one gene are equated with a very similar story. 
and uh, they inherited these features from the serpentine fathers. So you have Quetzalcoatl in America, for example, who's the fiery feathered serpent of the Aztecs or the Mayans, you know, the Quiche Maya. Um, then obviously in Australia, mile, thousands of miles away, you have the rainbow serpent instead. Then you go up to China, you know, and you've got the, the dragons and the dragon mythologies of China. I believe these were the fiery flying seraphim serpents who mixed themselves with humans and created the Nephilim. And this is what they would have looked like. So the Wangene is a fun one because it pretty much is quintessentially a clown by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I did a comparison image here somewhere. I've got it at the bottom if I can find it. Um, oh, did I not? Sorry, I didn't add it to this compilation. That's a shame. Um, but I will get it up later and I'll show you how it is quite literally. If you compare it to a modern Western clown, it's almost identical. So if we go back to the Rakshas again I showed earlier, this is one from Sri Lanka. Now, in Sri Lanka, they have their own odd traditions where they uh, do these dances wearing these demon masks, but they call them Rakshas rather than Rakshasas. But it's it's a you know it's a minor difference. If you look at these, obviously serpent iconography all the way through, a fiery serpentine headdress there made of snakes, a lot like a Medusa, and obviously the same Rakshas grin with the book teeth, bulging eyes, flared nostrils, and the tongue sticking out. And they wear these masks during. Um, exorcist rituals where they're trying to get rid of bad spirits from the tribes or within people and heal them of sicknesses um you'll find many cultures have their own way of using these masks or these costumes to interact with the spirit realm a lot of people have the superstition that you need to do this to cure illnesses uh, ward away bad weather or in other cases if it's not apotropaic which is the fancy word for scaring spirits away it's the other thing. It's they want to dress like a demon to be possessed by demons. They're trying to invite them in. So many of these cultures I'm discussing here are either doing one or the other. They're trying to scare the demon away or they're trying to attract it. Now, they can't both be right. Only one of the methods has to actually be realistically the way forward. And um, I would say dressing like a demon only serves to bring them into you, not scare them away. Um, and I think that's the true method, which most cultures practice more so than trying to scare them away. Um, but you'll find of throughout all forms of theatre, including the West, we have our Western clown. It's infiltrated even Eastern theatre. You have the face changers as well here who um, are infamous for very quickly just whipping these masks off and having a brand new patterned face very quickly. And these are quite a famous one. But you can see the, the influence of the Nephilim has kind of infiltrated everything all throughout history. And the aesthetics are always the same. This is a ritual in Spain where they, they run around with a stick with a pig's bladder blown up on the end. And they wear these clown looking masks with wide grins and they go around wearing bells and uh, basically cause chaos in the streets before a series of fasting before Lent. This is uh, your typical carnival, which is a European tradition based in the wild man. And we'll get a lot into the wild man as we go on, but this is just one European example of something that spreads all the way across Europe. And again, these ancient traditions go back to Thracian Dionysian worship cults. And Dionysus was an infamous fallen angel god who created hybrid humans, a lot like Nephilim, half human, half goat people. And uh, I think these are basically modern echoes of those ancient Thracian cult traditions where they would have a huge party, get absolutely smashed and drunk and have sex and do wild things. And then it's OK because they fast for 40 days afterwards, you know, um, but you'll find they always dress like basically quintessential Nephilim esque demons. And it's no surprise when you understand the ancient cults that these things come from. And um, they were venerate demon veneration cults in their origins. Um, this is the spirit festival of the fight of Khan, which you'll find in Thailand. Um, these people in obviously these rice pa uh, paddy type areas, these farming areas, they have this tradition where they um, dress like ghosts every year to scare them away. It's based on a story to do with uh, Buddha coming to their village once and his presence ended up waking all the dead. And all the, all the dead spirits were roaming around and then he had to scare them away or battle them away. And they venerate this event every, every year. And the way they dress, well, it's quintessentially like a Joker Jester demon with a huge, wide, toothy grin, big, bulging, ghostly eyes, huge uh, horns on top of their heads and multicolored fractal patterned clothing. Uh, this is just a minor example. But um, as we go through and I go through more compilations of images, you'll see. 
um, this gets wild in colour. But this is a very simple one. Uh, this again is, comes from a similar tradition within the um, the Raksha demons of Sri Lanka. Uh, this is a specific demon, a specific one, which um, was said to bring sickness and illness um, to a specific region. I think it was the uh, Yaka, the Yaka demon. I think they called it something like that. And this is basically you can't see it here, but it's actually holding little people in its hands that it eats. So it's actually a giant as well. <laughs> but it's this creature here is holding on to the legs of people tiny little humans in its hands um, and it's known for basically the story is an interesting one the story is that a um a the king and his wife his wife mysteriously got pregnant at some point and the king is like this cannot be mine um because i've not been around you know what i mean this is clearly not my child um and when the child was born it was hideously monstrous and disfigured so he kind of, um, you know, got rid of it and threw it away. And it lived by feeding on the carcasses of dead animals or something like that. And it grew to be this giant monster. Um, it was. It basically sounds like it was a Nephilim hybrid offspring, which was, which this female queen was impregnated with. You know, um, a typical Nephilim progeny story. I mean, if you go through all Greek mythology, it's all about the Greek gods raping the wives of kings and creating hybrid offspring and it sounds like this is just sri lanka's version of the same story you know and the offspring was this thing and in revenge for his father rejecting him or his so-called father he wasn't his real father you know he went and basically ate thousands of people and just destroyed these villages and he had to be subdued by another god another angel but in this case they referred to as buddha um, it's very odd, a very odd story indeed. But um, this beast ravaged and killed a lot of people in its time, and this is its. This is how they remember it with images like this: a huge, big, wide clown smile, you know, big bulging eyes, and serpentine patterned skin, because they would have inherited this from their parents, you know, serpent skin, just by the nature of their parents being fiery, flying serpents. And again, here it is, another example. It's chewing on a leg there. Um, quite a hideous looking monster when you actually consider it, you know, and it's got scaly skin there as you can see as well um, these are the, the general spirits, um, obviously ancestor spirits, note the pom-poms on the head and the golden headdress if it's not red hair, it's gold hair it's one of the two the Nephilim-esque features seem to have here's a, um, a culture in Papua New Guinea um, these are a cannibalistic culture within, I did a whole um episode on these for the Nephilim Look Like Clowns series I have on my channel. Um, but as you can see, red feathery headdress for wild hair and a red nose. Uh, this one is missing the white, the whitened up skin, but you'll, as you'll see as I go on, it's very common to add that for most of the other members of the tribe. This one just decided against it for some reason. But again, these are clownish features. It's got uh, a lot of the similar aesthetics to the Western clown. Going to South America, this is of the Selknum tribes. And now the, this tribe is relatively extinct now, very, very small in number. And these traditions don't really exist in large scale anymore because they were kind of genocided with the original, um, you know, the colonizations of these regions. But this is what they used to dress like in order to channel spirits and venerate the ancestor spirits. And you notice odd fractaled patterns there with elongated skulls, pointed skull caps. Um, as you can see here, this, this one with the black cone head has the four white pom-poms you often see on clown costumes going down as well. These are very much akin to fractaled matrix in the astral realm spirits. And again, what these people dress like is either one of two things. They're dressing like the demons as they look in the spirit realm, or they're dressing how the demons once looked when they were physical giants. It's one of the two. And I think this is, comes under spirit realm mimic. So uh, these, these tribes are known for taking very potent psychedelic drugs during their shamanistic rituals to connect to the spirit realm. And they're clearly trying to mimic something they've seen on the other side here. And these are the DMT jesters people see when they take large doses of dimethyltryptamine. They look something like this, you know, and they try to mimic them in their own rituals. So we can always, inf again, in when it comes to scripture, I just want to preface, you know, you can you can infer what the Nephilim looked like by finding very minuscule bits of information here and there in extra canonical books and a few passages in the Bible itself. But if you really want to know what they look like, you do have to go outside of scripture and look at these other cultures to get a good example of how they represent 
the disembodied spirits of, of of spirits and you know they wouldn't always call them demons a lot of them venerate them a lot of them consider them uh, the creators of their civilization or the bringers of power and strength or something and they want to make contracts with them when they want to make deals with them you know which is why they do this um, but this is how we find out what they actually look like we we look around and pay attention to what's right in front of us here's another rakshasa mask um i think this one is a representation of rangda the demon queen um, she, I think this comes from the Balinese sect of the archipelagos of Indonesia, um, and these, the, this is from Bali specifically, and they were these in the dramatizations of uh, Barong. This is Barong, the dragon god, fighting against Rangda, the demon queen. So what you see here is a dragon. This is the seraphim angel. This is the fathers of the Nephilim. This is what they would have looked like, and this is a human dragon hybrid. This is what the offspring would have looked like, you know, and it's just showing you here what this is what the Nephilim would have looked like. These are the children of fallen angels mixed with humans. They looked like this monstrosity. And this is what the 18th century clowns are based on. So before we carry on, first, first of all, there's an example of the mask being worn of Rangda, the demon queen, on a, in a play with the black and white checkered fractal pattern clothing, the pale white skin, the, the red lips and the wild red hair not dissimilar from a modern western clown in terms of aesthetical motifs but just to really prove this point if we go to see joseph grimaldi now joseph grimaldi was the first quintessential um sorry joseph a uh, modern clown all modern clowns are based off this uh, specific actor of the 1800s he invented or so so called he invented the modern costume of a clown as we know it today he was the first to dress like this and this here is an image painted during the time to commemorate the new costume. And this is a very specifically chosen pose because this is identical to the um, Rakshasas of Thailand temples um, here. So if you look at the costume worn by these guys, it can become very clear that that is identical to the costume Joseph Grimaldi is wearing here as well. It's no different. Um, it's got the same polka dots, the same patterns, the same dress frills, uh, similar face makeup as well. And these are the Rakshish, the demons, or the Nephilim being guardians of the temples, which were likely dedicated to them to begin with anyway, when you actually look into the histories of these things. And here's Joseph Grimaldi in a similar pose, but upside down, wearing a very similar dress. Now, prior to Joseph Grimaldi dressing like this, clowns in British theatre did not look like that. They used to look like this, um, which is a very boring Elizabethan servant rags. Nothing special about it. Pretty plain, pretty boring, pretty basic. But then suddenly, in the 1800s, it gets changed into this psychedelic serpent-looking demon thing. And the reason for this is because a son of a Freemason called Charles Dibdin had taken over the theatre at the time. And his father, Charles Dibdin Sr., was an infamous travelling Freemason who had connections to India. His brother was a, uh, was a serving member of the um, British Navy at the time and was actually colonising India with the East India Company. And I do believe this Freemason brought Indian iconography back with him of the Rakshasa demons and convinced his son who had taken over the theatres of the time where Joseph Grimaldi was working to dress them like this. This is basically inserting demon iconography into the most mainstream popular theatre entertainment industry of the time. It's an odd one indeed and I go into heavy detail on my channel about the history about behind all this, the internal politics and how this all happened. But make no mistake, this costume of a clown is based off of these right here. And you can even see the aesthetical similarities. It's it's uncanny where the costume comes from. Um, but it's more specifically, going back to the Bali regions, so this is in Thailand, but in Bali they have the Kalasungsang version um, of the same demon. And the Kalasungsang is the upside-down demon. And it is a Rakshasa. It's just their flavour of Rakshasa. And here it is doing its handstand. And again, there's Joseph Grimaldi doing the same handstand with the same face and the same look. So that's what I meant when I earlier said clowns are quite literally modelled after demons. It's not even a joke. That's that's exactly where they come from in their costume and design. And that did become the industry standard from that day forward. 
So, you know, going back to these images I'm showing you here, this is just these cultural specific ways of representing the, the demonic entities. And this is what the clown is modeled after. Um, and, you know, here is another example in, another, in, in India itself of a Rakshasa demon. This one's a lot more human looking, but still red lips, white skin, psychedelic fractal color clothing and a wild gold or gold or red headdress. Um, we've got these as well. I think these are from Beijing, I think. Um, these are the dead sp the spirits of the dead. And Buddhism, it's quite common to see these these faces above some of the gods of death and destruction. Um, and these are wide grinning, not human looking skulls, are they? Humans don't have that many teeth, <laughs> you know, it's such a wide, a grinning manner. Um, these are the spirits of the Nephilim. Because the Nephilim would have had incredibly wide jaws. The Nephilim had serpentine fathers. Snakes can dislocate their jaws to eat their prey and have a very wide maw and smile. And so did the Nephilim, they had a very wide grin. If we go over to, let's say, even the Pacific Northwest and look at the totem poles there, um, this is, um, which ones are these again? Sorry, I, I get a loose track of the amount of uh, cultures I'm looking at. But this is uh, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, and they have these totem poles here. And even they use the same motifs when uh, describing these odd animistic uh, entities that they put on their totem poles. These Look in the background there, you've got a hybrid human-looking thing on the bottom of that green and red one with the book teeth, very similar to the Rakshasar. Then on top, you have a human-eagle hybrid um, there's the Rakshasa. So they would say that's a beaver or something, but I don't think it really is. I don't know many beavers that actually look like this, you know. That's a human-animal hybrid of some kind, very similar to the Rakshasas. Um, then you have an eagle-human hybrid at the top as well. But then you've got this thing with white skin, red nose, red lips, tongue kind of sticking out. Uh, this is the same creature. This is the Nephilim as well, immortalized in, in wood. Here's another example. In the background, you've got a similar sort of actress looking thing as well. Red nose, red lips, wide grin, sharp angular buck teeth, a human hybrid with something. Not quite an animal, but they always claim, oh, well, these just represent animals, specific animals. I'm not so sure. I'm really not so sure. I think even me, they may have forgotten why these things were actually carved in wood originally, and they've come up with stories since, but uh, the similarities are uncanny to everything I've just been discussing from all these other cultures. In Africa, ancestor spirit worship is rife, but more, more often than not, they look something like this. Very psychedelic and fractaled in nature with, with hair, strands and straw, which they whip around at fast speeds to make them look as though they're just nothing but a, a blur and made of frequency and sound. They're trying to represent the spiritual realm version of Nephilim here. Because once the Nephilim looked physical like this, let's say, once they died, they became disembodied and ethereal and more spiritual and ended up looking something more akin to this. Now, this is what people see now in these other realms. Um, so that's another representation of that. Uh, but you'll find, like I said, here's another mask from the North Americas representing demons. Here's the Oni demons of Japan in the Kabuki theater as well. A very similar face to the, to the uh, Rakshasa with the wide grin, the buck teeth, the wild red hair. Um, here's another one from Bali, humans with unnaturally wide grins, buck teeth and red lips, multicolored black and white fractal snakes all over the place to symbolize their hybrid nature of being half snake, half human. Um, here's the Selkinum tribe images again from South America, very psychedelic looking with these odd looking antennae up here as well, like Jester's cap. Even got the geishas, they uh, black the teeth up, red the lips and white the skin, and these are actually comedians. They're entertainers by nature, very clownish in action. Uh, but it's an emulation of something. This is considered a beauty standard. And you have to wonder where these beauty standards actually originate from. Well, the Nephilim were very tall and very powerful, and people would look up to them as gods. So they would also try to emulate them. And I believe most of the cultures we have passed down from every culture are echoes of when we used to venerate them as gods. Here's the Fighter Con once again, the spirit festival I mentioned earlier with the demon masks. These ones are a lot more elaborate than the slightly poorer ones you saw earlier. But now we have the inclusion of the psychedelic fractal patterned clothing akin to them in their etheric sense or a representation of serpentine skin. Serpent patterned, multicolored, fractal patterned skin with a large, wide, toothy grin and elongated features. Uh, these are quintessential Nephilim esque. Rakshasa-esque looking entities. And here's a close-up one of them as well. 
And then if we go to Greece in Europe, we have the Gorgon. The Gorgon, again, the same aesthetics, the same style teeth, the tongue sticking out. This is a new continent now, new culture, thousands of miles away, okay? With the same big, wide, red-lipped grin, pale white skin, odd patterns on the face that aren't naturally human. Here it is on a piece of older pottery, huge head, huge red hair, big, wide, serpentine grin with the tongue sticking out, acting like a clown, looking like it's doing the, uh, na 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 look there with its hands in the air, you know? <laughs> very, very irreverent creatures. But that's a rep also a representation of a gorgon. Here's another representation of a gorgon with its tongue sticking out, its mouth really wide grinned, wild red hair, very pale skin, um, elongated features. Here's another example of a gorgon, tongue sticking out. This is all Grecian representations of Medusa, specifically. Now Medusa is always depicted as a serpent woman with serpents for hair. But if you go to the oldest potteries representing Medusa, she looks more human than, than serpents. She doesn't have snakes for hair. That's just a modern stylization that has no basis in reality. She had red hair and she had pale white skin. And she was a, a hybrid between um, Typhon, which is a serpent sea god, and Echidna, who was a siren. Now, it's said in the Book of Enoch that the women who mated with the fallen angels became sirens. That's what it says specifically. So sirens are nothing more than human women who have become hybrids. So she, Medusa, who you see here, is the daughter of a serpent god, a seraphim angel, and a human woman, a siren. So this is what you get. You get something that looks like a smiling clown <laughs> and it's everywhere in every culture is the Papua New Guinea tribe once more I mentioned earlier you saw the old gentleman with the red nose and the red headdress uh, here well this is the same tribe I'm showing you now and it's just one of the young young boys in from it and he decided to wipe the skin up and add the red nose instead a lot like a, a clown we have today this is because they they worship these spirits, they venerate them, they commune with them, they even eat people based like they used to. <laughs> you know, this is a cannibalistic tribe. Here's the gorgon again, which I just showed you, with its tongue sticking out. But this time, this is on a piece of pottery. This is on Athena's chest. Now, Athena was actually given the head of Medusa as a gift by Perseus after Medusa was slain and beheaded, um, and. Medusa wore the head of, of sorry, uh, Athena wore the head of Medusa as a talisman for good luck and protection. And as a result, you find a lot of Greek armor and helmets and shields have this face on it for protection and good luck because Athena wore the literal head of this beast around her neck as protection on an amulet on her chest. So this is what it looks like. It looks like a quintessential modern clown. And this is a simplified version of these things you're seeing here. But this is painted on very old pottery, thousands of years old. You know, and this is their representations of these creatures. Going back to India, to ancestor spirit worship, uh, these are from a much older uh, cult, uh, something called the Theum. And in the Theum, a member of the cult dresses in extremely psychedelic patterned clothing like this, and is it's their job to channel the spirits for them, for the tribe to ask it questions and ask it for favors and things like that. But while the person is channeling the entities, they have to eat anything that's given to them as a gift. So often they'll be given live chickens as a gift. And because the, because the demon's in them and they are being given a gift, the person channeling the demon has to bite the head off that chicken and eat it, you know, <laughs> because it's <laughs> they've got to give the demon its blood type of thing. Um, here in Africa, we have a similar thing. White skin, red lips, wear red headdress of some kind. They're doing the same thing. They're trying to channel the ancestor spirits. They want to be possessed by them, so they dress like them. Um, here's another example of a Rakshasa from Indian iconography with the many arms. Big, wide, toothy grin, fiery red hair, pale white skin. Um, what else have we got? Here's back to the Americas again. Tongue sticking out, red nose, red lips, blue skin in this respect with lizards all around the head. Um, here's another example of uh, Barong from Balinese culture who fought against Rangda the Demon Queen. So this is a demon, um, a fallen angel, shall we say, who created the offspring. 
Um, here we in Papua New Guinea again, similar rituals, psychedelic fractal cult clothing and clownish like makeup on the face. Here's the, um, the mud men, Asura mud men of Papua New Guinea, a different tribe. They wipe the skin up, give themselves big wide grins with buck teeth, you know, <laughs> and it's the same thing. I can go to any culture anywhere and they'll have their own version of this with similar aesthetical features. Here's the fighter con once more. Look at this one here with this big wide long elongated serpentine featured grin you know very scary stuff when you actually start looking at them here's a very old mask of the same things the uh, the raksha's of sri lanka uh, same entity this is what a human serpent hybrid would actually look like an absolutely terrifying monster to behold here's a stylized version of rangda the demon queen i was mentioning earlier with the pale white skin though she wouldn't have looked quite as human these masks I showed earlier are far closer to what she actually would have looked like. Something like this. Um, very terrifying stuff indeed. And so we're coming to the end of this uh, pretty much. But if there's the Wanginas I showed you earlier. Next to a modern clown. The Wanginas are painted on the, on, on the inside of caves more often than not. And only a specifically chosen shaman of the tribe is allowed to go in there once a year. And repaint them to keep them fresh. So these are ancients, these have been around forever, and these are representations of something that was knocking about in the ancient past, and it's quintessentially a, it's no different than a modern day representation of a clown, as you can see here. Um, more examples of the tongue sticking out in other cultures, and here's another Raksha's mask. And then if we go to Europe, I skipped over some of the European ones for the wild man tradition, but Europe has their own kind of version of this, and it looks something like this. This is Bulgaria. Um, they have something called the cookery. Now, the cookery is based in, like I said, ancient Thracian tradition centered around the worship of Dionysus, who's a Greek god of um, theater, debauchery, wine, sex, partying, drugs, all of those things, you know, all the good stuff. And this is what they dress like uh, to represent not only Dionysus himself, but also the wild man giants. And the giants were not simply just hairy men with clubs. They were very colourful creatures, as you can see through these representations they've made of them. And they dressed like this to ward away evil spirits just before fasting. That's why they do this. That's why they say they do this. And they jangle their bells to scare away the evil spirits. But as you see from these other cultures, let's say um, the African cultures here. Well, they're dressing like it. This witch doctor, for example is dressing this way to be possessed by the spirit and channel it for power. While these guys are dressing this way to scare away the spirits in order to be free from demons. So who's correct? You know, who's got the right, uh, who's doing the right thing here? Which one's actually getting the desired result? I think these guys are getting the desired result. I think these guys have been duped. They dress like the thing to channel the thing without realizing it. They're actually only helping feed demons during that party they have dressed this way. Because they're channeling the demons unbeknownst to them. The only difference between a European practice of this culture, like the um, the Kuretos of Portugal here, for example, who do the exact same thing. Complete opposite side of Europe, by the way. Completely disconnected cultures just happen to be connected to the same continent. Thousands of miles apart, but they also have the same tradition of dressing like the psychedelic monsters, the serpent skin hairy monsters, the wild men as they call them, just like the Bulgarians do here. And they also believe they're scaring away evil spirits before a period of fasting, just like these Bulgarians do here with the pom-poms, the polka dots, party hats they're wearing here, uh, the pale white skin, the red nose, the red lips. They're, rep they're dressing like things and channeling them without realizing it is my own personal take on the situation. Um, demons... You have to understand, Nephilim want bodies. They don't have bodies anymore, okay? They were killed, they were wiped out. Now, Pre-flood, they were killed each other off as a punishment for the angels who created them. The angels had to watch their beloved ones murder each other as a punishment for creating them. And the, that's the Greek story of the Clash of the Titans, you know? And, for example, the, once they were all dead, they became disembodied entities, demons, but then they had children too, you know, and uh, those children of the Nephilim also mated with women and you got hybrids going all the way down the bloodlines all the way up until the flood. Then you got humans corrupting themselves just before the flood as well, as it's described in the book of Jasher. And you would have got all these psychedelic creatures together that would have got absolutely decimated once the flood came. Once they all died, 
they became these psychedelic monsters which we see now in the fractal matrix in the other realm as disembodied spirits and all these cultures do is dress like them now to scare them away so called but uh these cultures who channel them they want them in their body that's the point they're trying to get them in their body okay and they feed the demon once they're in there because the demons don't have bodies anymore they use your fingers your eyes your tongue your nose your skin to feel taste smell see and eat and do every all those things you know they use your senses to experience things once more that's what possession is truly about these shamans willingly give their vessel over to the demon in exchange they get knowledge power the ability to heal for example or something or the ability to uh, see other places or travel through to other places and, and know what their enemy is doing or typical witch doctor voodoo stuff you know whatever it is uh, there's an exchange going on but in exchange they have to feed the demon stuff like nicotine alcohol sex drugs murder whatever it is you know whatever the demon desires the vessel gives it to them through their own body um, now they know what they're doing do these guys know what they're doing I don't think they do, because they believe they're scaring the demons away. But it's a, is it a coincidence that when they dress like this, they have a huge party of excess where they drink a lot and eat a lot and do a load of horrible things? Probably not a coincidence. It's like, a, it's like Mardi Gras for the demons once a year, where they get to have a good time through all these idiots who don't know what they're actually doing. You know what I mean? It's kind of naive to think otherwise. And um, that's what a lot of my work basically is about. But there's, there's a visual overview but I do, I do, I have, I have thousands of more images, you know, showing this. Here's another one from another culture, um, a bit more of an example of the the big wide grinned uh, mask you saw earlier from, uh, I think, I think they're from Bangkok, I think they were. Um, but again, the undead spirits here, the, the hungering spirits, as they call them, and you have to, the a lot of people leave out food at, at altars for them for, to feed the hunger, hungering spirits, um, who have an in inquenchable appetite but no means to feed because they're undead you know <laughs> and uh, that actually looks like a joker it does exactly yeah so coming no, coming to the modern western version of clowns uh, they are they are quite literally a continuation of what a freemason injected into culture in the 1800s here through the through then and this became the industry standard now i've just shown you there that people dress like this to channel demons okay and what we've done in the West, we've occulted that. It's been hidden by secret societies. So you're not, you're not supposed to know that a clown is a representation of a demon. Because the, the, the clue is, if you can get as many people dressing this way as possible, you're opening up more channels for them to get into our world more readily. Okay, and they would rather that we didn't realize that what was going on. So I, one of my recent videos on my series is... Um, Sorry, let me just find if I could maybe find it here quickly. I've got it up. Uh, no, it's not going to work. Uh, my channel here. Yes, yeah, so if you go to my channel here and you go to playlists, and I've got my Nephilim Look Like Clowns playlist here. And. Like I said, there's a, there's a lot of videos here to get through, a lot of things you can go see. I've got Nephilim Clowns in 15 minutes summarized here. But my recent one was actually about the media industry here. And I'll just mute that. And it was showing how they're actually showing clowns everywhere right now in the media. Um, and they have been pushing them hard on us for the past decade. And it's their attempt, in a way, to popularize the clown in the consciousness of the modern Western world. Because if you can get more people idolizing clowns and wanting to dress like clowns and thinking clowns are cool, then what they're getting people to do is dress in ancestor spirit worship summoning costumes without realizing it, you know. And uh, just being ignorant of the spiritual law doesn't make you immune to the spiritual law, unfortunately. So you'll find, like I said, as, as we're showing through here, these are the ancestor spirit worship culture examples of these creatures and how they dress like them, um, and it can get pretty it can get pretty trippy. Now these are a lot of the ones I just showed you earlier, which I already threw into this video as an example. Um, there's a few extras thrown in there. There they are, the Kratos again. There's the Rakshasa temple demons. 
you got the uh, Aston African ancestor. <laughs> that was quite funny. Literally eating a person. There's the Hayokas of the Americas, the cannibalistic tribes, and I've got here. This is another cannibalistic tribe. Red hair, white skin, same thing. And you got the examples there. You know, there's the dragon god. There's the human hybrid offspring, and there's the clown, which is which is modelled after it. And it was all done by design. This is not a, an accident, you know. The clown was purposefully injected into Western media in the 1800s through the theatre by Freemasons, okay? It was done specifically as a means to make people openly worship demons without realising it, you know. And you can look at all clown symbolism throughout circuses, especially going into the 19th and 20th century, with there were all Freemason-run affairs, Freemasons own the industry today. All the Shriners still own the circuses now and have the biggest traveling circus, you know, in America. Um, and they always have bro, as you can see here next to the old posters, the Cole Bros Circus. Bro, brother, is not because they were just brothers. They were related to each other, okay? A brother is a member of the fraternity. That's what you call yourself. You are a brother if you are a Freemason, Okay, and they were telling you then they were all brothers and all ten circuses, all run by Freemasons, got together and put on a huge show called King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, and it was a huge spectacular. You know, it travelled all across America and it was talking about Solomon, the temple builder, who used the ring to control the demons to build the temple. You know, and then he had these strange exotic wives who brought him exotic. Um, beliefs which brought his ultimate downfall you know and these type of things and anyway anyway there were all freemasons got together and did this show every costume was made by a company called the anderson arms company who made all the costumes for the freemason lodges for their own little rituals you know and you realize that the circus was literally a copy of freemasonic lodge rituals first of all a ringmaster um of a circus Let's get an image of it. Typical ringmaster here with his top hats and his cane and his whip and his uh, long trench coat. Well, that's actually a worshipful grandmaster. Worshipful master Freemasons of a lodge. Um, the worshipful master of a Freemason lodge is the only one allowed to wear a top hat. A lot of people don't know this, but they'll openly admit it. Only the leader of the lodge can wear a hat. Sometimes they wear a different shaped hat depending on their personality or their region to bring their own little flair to it. But more often than not, it is just a black top hat. The Worshipful Grand Master. And he's the only one allowed to wear a hat. And so is the orchestrator of the ritual of the circus, the ring leader. And it turns out, if you look into the meaning of the hats and why, why is the leader the only one allowed to wear a hat? Because it represents the crown of Solomon. They believe that, um, no, as an honour to the king, nobody else would wear a hat in the past. And I don't think King Solomon personally was wearing top hats back in the day, but it's supposed to represent so the crown of Solomon. So is it a surprise that they all got together and put on a huge show, show called... Um, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. You know, and here's the tale, here's the story. But if I put circus next to it, you'll find all the posters. Here we go. And here it is uh, advertised. Um, move this across so people can see. A grand biblical spectacle. Ten truly good shows merged into one. Uh, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, ten Freemason-run circuses coming together to put on a huge show uh, dedicated to their idol, which is the temple builder, which is Solomon, who controls demons with a magical ring. The Ring Master. That's what King... That's, that's who he is. You know, that's what the Ring Leader is. He uses... He's the Lord of the Ring. He orchestrates the demons to perform the ritual with his magical power over the ring well the ring leader orchestrates the clowns to create the circus performance it's an analogy for freemasonic ritual through and through it's all just similes and metaphor for the same thing the clowns represent the demons the ringmaster represents solomon 
It's the same thing, okay? And this is well documented. This isn't even like... A, a, people have written about this before, you know, and I wrote about it in my own book, how this this is quite literally where you get circuses from. They are trying to copy Freemason rituals in an occult manner, and the public can get involved with the ritual without realizing it. But initiates into the Brotherhoods know exactly what they're looking at and what they're there for. And... Um, Anyway, coming to the modern world, circuses are a bit old and dead. Now they have TV, and we have the internet, and uh, they are pushing the circus and clown symbolism hard on people and have been for a while, a, ve a very long time, you know. Never mind the fact that they push entheogens on people where they interact with clown demons in the DMT realm. Never mind this. These are some examples of what people see, you know. Um... But it's, there's a modern one that was quite popular recently called the Amazing Digital Circus. But as I explain in the rest of this video, that is just a a small part of a long, long, long pattern of pushing clowns on us through the media for a very, very long time. Uh, so let's see if I can't just speed this up so it'll fire through. But uh, as you can see, in all forms of media, they have been pushing this on us for a very long time. Clown fashion right now is the height of pinnacle fashion to dress like a clown. Even L, for example, I'm not even joking, all right? So let's look at a clown fashion, uh, 2023. And here it is. Um, the runaway trend lately is clown core fashion trend of 2023. And this is the magazine L, a fashion magazine, which is explaining how, you know, clown core fashion is in. This is it now. This is what's going to come into your outlet store soon enough, a watered down version of this. But when you know what I've just told you, dressing like the thing channels the thing all they're doing is encouraging more of the general population to dress like a psychedelic clown monster in the hopes of being possessed by them without them realizing it opening up more channels for the nephilim to come to our realm uh, david bowie is a famous example i mean the biggest secret of the music industry isn't to have talent it's just to pale up your skin and red up the hair and get as psychedelic as you can with the clothing and you will be chosen you will be elevated and you will be put in front of people because they want to make an idol out of you. Because if you are an idol dressed that way, you will inspire more people to also dress that way, therefore causing more channels. That's all it's ever been about. That's all it ever will be about. And um, now I've said it, <laughs> you're going to see it everywhere. So I'll let this just run in the background, and I'll, I'll, I've talked for a while there, and I think I've given a lot of visuals to explain the gist of my theory. And uh, do you have any questions? Is there anything you want to want to bring up you you're just blowing my mind away here it's a crazy <laughs> oh my god when you were studying and researching this it must have blown your mind away yeah by finding these things you must have been like oh my god why doesn't anyone see this that's crazy <laughs> oh my god that is so cool though that you've discovered this so do you think that there's some kind of obviously agenda behind all this you said they're trying to get us ready they as in the elites is trying to get us ready for something coming because they have to kind of by i forget the law or the whatever that they have to do they have to tell us these things so if they tell us in this sort of way they kind of um um they're allowed to do this and destroy the world <laughs> because they told us <laughs> Well, yeah, there's that idea of karmic uh, retribution. That they're 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 off the hook because they told us and we didn't listen. Off the hook. Sure, you, yeah, I've heard that before. But there's also the whole externalization of the hierarchy agenda at play here, where um, they are basically trying to um, slowly reveal themselves for what they truly are, slow enough for us to accept them and not fight back and accept it as okay or normal or even cool. Um, so I do think this slow push to make clowns popular in the psyche of the general population and fun and innocent and something for the kids even is is because we're going to start seeing more manifestations of creatures like this coming into the real world soon enough. Um, and if we're kind of already pre-programmed to be used to seeing stuff like that, we might not be so reactionary when the Nephilim do return, if, if that's where they're going with it, you know. Um, but it, re realistically, it's, it's hard to say what the final agenda is here exactly. I, I do think fundamentally it's, it's, it's about getting more and more people to dress in costumes which are worn by ancestor spirit worship cults without realizing it. Because it opens up channels for these entities to get to our world more readily. 
I think that's it's, just, it's as simple as that. And uh, obviously, you're finding the media. The, the demonic clown has become more popular over the fun childhood friendly clown. And I think it's because they are now hinting at the truth of the matter. The clowns literally are demons, and they're letting us know that now, you know. Um, but a lot of people will never really make that connection. And a lot of people kind of. They idolize clowns because of their irreverent nature and how they're running commentary on the absurdity of society and all this nonsense that people pontificate about and get all uh, fancy and, and pretentious about, you know. Um, so they think that the clown's a good thing and clowns, we need clowns in order to uh, not take life too seriously and to uh, comment on, like I said, the ridiculous of existence. But the truth is, dressing like this is no laughing matter. It's not a joke. It's actually very serious. I mean, just because this person here is doing it for a bit of fun for Halloween does not mean that these cultures I showed you earlier are not doing it in a very serious reverent manner. You know, this is their, they are their gods. You know, they take it extremely seriously. Like, th these people, for example, let's find another one here. Um, I've probably got a good one. For example, this, the fame in India. This person is very serious. Okay, this is an extremely important ritual for a very serious god that they are ter both terrified of and venerate and worship and idolize, okay? So when they dress like this, they are doing it because they want to be possessed in order to have communion with the gods. Okay, that's why they're doing this. But when, I don't know, Sophie over here dresses like a clown for Halloween for a bit of fun with her mates, she's not taking it that seriously. But the effect is still the same. She will end up channeling Nephilim demons just as much as that person I just showed you there is. There's no difference. Only one is ignorant of it. One is very well aware of what they're doing. Do you understand? So it's kind of, we have to be extremely careful about how we choose to dress. There's more to it than we think. We in the West have been have been numbed to these facts, these spiritual facts. We don't take it seriously enough. We don't even we don't even know this is a, even a possibility or a reality. We don't think there are consequences to dressing certain ways. In fact, most of the Western Hemisphere doesn't even believe in a spiritual realm or even understand that any of this could be possible. They haven't got a clue. And look, you know, every year there's a ritual called Red Nose Day where they get the whole public to dress like a clown for the kids, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> for charity. And this is how much of a joke it is to the Freemasonic control that they have over the Western Hemisphere and the, and the world. We don't realize it. Yet you have Shriners who all have their own clown sect where they dress up like clowns and go to children who are dying in hospital and scare the crap out of them in the name of charity and love and, and you know harmony and, and whatever. But then just a step above Freemasonry and shrining, you have the highest order, which is the Royal Order of the Jesters. Freemasons know clowns are a very serious thing. Freemasons know full well that it's of the highest honor to be titled a jester because they are working intimately with Nephilim demonic spirits. These secret societies are continuations of ancient serpent cults from the antediluvian past. They are the mystery wisdom schools just in the modern day. They commune with, venerate, and work with Nephilim, with demons. Secret societies, the men involved with these, are just physical foot soldiers for the spiritual bosses they have, which are the Nephilim. Then above the Nephilim, they answer to their fathers, the fallen angels, the watchers in rebellion against God. It's a spiritual hierarchy. It's a war. This is a military operation, you know. And uh, in order to commune openly with their bosses, the secret societies have turned their costume they wear to channel their gods into a joke. So we don't think it's anything. It's hidden in plain sight. We just think they're being a bit silly. But what they're actually doing is the exact same thing here as these ancestor spirit cultures are doing when they dress that way. You know, like the Hayoka does here when he's trying to channel the thunder gods of the Wakinian. You know, he's dressing this way to very specifically channel and communicate with thunder gods, Nephilim creatures. And, when, and that's exactly what these people are doing here. It's the same thing, but it's hidden in plain sight. It's layered under comedy and nuance. So we're not supposed to realize it. It's occult. It's hidden in plain sight, you know. Um, and yeah, very, very sneaky. 
these guys are they pulled the wool over our eyes for a long time and uh I've basically blown the lid off it all for them. <laughs> and that's I it. know. Yeah. I know. You haven't gotten any threats, have you? <laughs> no. No, I <laughs> think God. I think they know people aren't going to take it seriously. I don't think I don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm a threat to them really. I don't think they're, they're that they're that worried. Um and I I think even a lot of um only the highest levels would really be aware of this truth, I think. Mm. And I know they are aware of it. I know they are aware of this, and I'm not making it up. Quite simply, because, for example, someone told me just a few months ago, and I've been doing this since 2016, making these connections. They told me that, oh, did you know that there's an episode of Supernatural? Um, where it was made in, like, 2002 or something like that. Um... Let's see if I can get the actual episode up here. So, here's a, the talking here. Sam, one of the lead characters, is talking about a Rakshasa demon. It says, a Rakshasa is a race of ancient Hindu creatures. They appear in human form and feed on human flesh. That's not true, first of all. That's it. That's a fictionalized... That's pure fiction. They never appear in human form. Rakshasas are not human in any way. They are Nephilim creatures. But obviously the media adds layers of fiction to the truth here. So take this with a pinch of salt, what I'm saying, okay? But he's saying here, you know, they feed on human flesh, they can make themselves invisible, they can't enter a home without being invited, so a bit of vampire mythos mixed in with them there. And then Dean says, they dress up like clowns, and children invite them in. Why don't they just feed on the kids? And then Sam says, not enough meat on the bones, maybe? Apparently, Rakshasas live in squalor. They sleep on the bed of insects and have to feed a few times every 20 to 30 years. Slow metabolism, I guess. So, in this episode of season two, which was aired years ago, like, I'm talking like over a decade ago, they were talking about a demon called a Rakshasa that dresses like a clown to get children to invite them into their homes. So, they were telling you in media. Everything I've just said decades ago. The, the people who write these scripts know the truth, you know, and they've implanted it here into a popular TV show years ago. Rakshasas and clowns are inexplicably linked. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, the Rakshasas, the Nephilim feed every 20 to 30 years. Isn't that the exact same plot as Stephen King's It? You know, if you look at It from Stephen King, um, Pennywise. He comes out every 27 years to feed, I believe. And the the books in two halves, when they were kids and when they were adults, because 27 years had passed once more, you know. And it is an interdimensional killer hybrid monster creature from another dimension who manifests in our reality as a clown uh, or whatever people fear, because they also you know feed off of fear and... Um, I do think there's something to be said for the fear elements in demons feeding off of it. I think that's a large part of it, in a way. And I think they claim here he wants to put fear into the people because the blood gets infused with adrenochrome and it makes them taste better. I think that's what it says in It. And we know that's a real practice in real life. And we know, I'm sure you've heard of that before, maybe we don't have to get into that today, but it's a pretty dark part of conspiracy world. But uh, yeah, they've been putting this in media forever. They've been telling That's you crazy. to. They've been telling us this for a while. There's literally a film. There's literally a film called Clown, which came out in 2014. Okay, and this is two years before I even started my research and came to any of this. And this film is literally about a guy who finds a costume in the attic of a clown. He needs one very quickly for his daughter's birthday. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he puts on the costume and he can't take it off. It's stuck on him. It starts fusing with him. Okay, he tries to rip the nose off and ends up causing this effect. You know what I mean? And he starts to transform into a reptilian creature monster thing that eats children. All right? And he has to eat five children to be free of the curse, it turns out. Because what he did was put on the skin That's of an crazy. ancient god called a cloyne, is which is a reptilian hybrid creature. Okay, <laughs> so that is literally the story I'm explaining here, that you dress like the thing to be possessed by the thing, right? And here he is dressing, yep. dressing in serpent skin, and he ends up looking like a killer clown because he gets possessed by a flesh 
eating monster. <laughs> right? It's there in this film that from 2014. And I only discovered this after I got all my research done. You know, so it's not like I've just watched too many films or something and I've, I have a wild <laughs> imagination. They like this is they, these are the facts and they've been telling us in media, just like they always hint at things before they happen through predictive programming for decades. OK, for decades. And shortly yeah. after. The oh. clown people started showing up, right? Two, two years later. 2016. Yep, two, yeah. two years later. Yeah, absolutely. That is creepy. There is a guy, I don't know his name, in Hollywood, supposedly. Um, I seen him on a podcast somewhere, I can't remember where. But he um, tattooed his face like a clown. And he got really popular in um, Hollywood. He had literally like a red nose and uh, red lips. And he was telling his story. He doesn't want to be part of this crazy Hollywood whatever that they're doing and they make him so popular um uh, because he's like bozo the clown and uh, yeah. he's the, you know who i'm talking about yeah you're talking about richard he's like this richard the barber yeah 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 the hair cutting guy isn't that crazy <laughs> yeah so he he from what i gathered he's a barber from california who got really into yeah. the, the, the the hollywood fame scene he was well known in the circles from the story i've heard him tell and he was invited to all the parties and stuff and kind of accepted instantly. And But he says himself he wasn't really about all the stuff they were doing and he wasn't really into it all, you know. And he, he got to see some things other people otherwise wouldn't have seen simply because of the way he looks. Because um, they probably thought he was down to clown, you know. He was one of them, like, because of the way he was dressing. But um, he comes out now, you know, exposing all this stuff today, uh, so-called. And he's now a born-again Christian. He's going around exercising demons out of people, he says, you know. Um, but at, at the same time, I don't know. I don't know, you know. Uh, the guy's a young Christian. You know, I think he's on fire for God, as he calls it, you know. So I think he's doing his own thing. But I would highly advise him to look at my research into clowns and make his own decision about what that actually is because he still heavily leans into it even now, you know. He, I mean, how do you take that off your face, though, right? True, true. I mean, it's true. like permanent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's always win it in him. True. Well, God looks at the heart, not the flesh, you know, mm. not the outside appearance. And I'm, I'm very much of the same. So I'm not going to judge anybody because they, they have a permanent scar on their face. That is the depiction of a demon. You know, there's, there's, I, can't, I can't disparage people like that. And I don't know where his heart truly lies. So I'm not going to say the guy's evil just because he looks this way. Again, we all, who doesn't go through existence without a few scars? You know, who doesn't come through, come through this life without in some way being influenced by this, this demonic world. Um, we all leave with our own scars. But he's to, he, I think, you know, I've seen videos where he's still getting piercings. He's still doing the body modification stuff, even though he's a born again Christian. And we're not, no, nobody's perfect, you know, at the end of the day. So I don't want to, again, I don't want to disparage the guy. I don't know him. I never talked to him. Um, I did reach out to him when he first got onto YouTube because I knew he may find my work eventually, you know, and hear about it. And I wanted him to hear from me first that, you know, listen, mate, if you want to talk, I'm free. Um, I'm happy you've come to Christ, you know, best of luck, basically. But he never responded. Yeah. And I don't know if he knows my work or not or has even considered this angle. I would hope he does look into it. Uh, because uh, if I was him, you know, as a born again Christian, I would be highly weary of continuing to lean into the clown aesthetic. I would. Yeah. And, but, but again, what can he do otherwise? I understand it though, because it's kind of it's kind of who is Richard the barber if he's not the clown? He has an identity issue to deal with here. You know, it's kind yeah. of it's not going to be easy to let go of a lifetime of identity you know, that is revolving yeah. around something he's so heavily invested into. Um, so fair enough, you know, and I, who, yeah. who am I to say otherwise? But yes, I have heard of him <laughs> to answer your question. It's crazy, though, that he got so popular because he's a clown and he looked like a clown and Hollywood just really put him on a pedestal, basically. Yeah, yeah. And even now, you know, I think we, we froze. Yeah, I, I got the gist of what you're saying at the end. there, But even now, he's still kind of put on a pedestal in a way, which is odd. Mm. And he's still encouraged and promoted crazy. through the media. I love yeah. what you've shown me today. That's amazing. I, I don't want to take up any of, of your time because I know you're so busy. But oh, my God, thank you so much. I hope we can talk again. No, absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I know I, I rambled on a little bit there. 
<laughs> no, I love it. No, people want to hear you and what you have to say. Are you kidding? Thank you. No, and you have a book out, right? Um, it's about to be published in a couple of months. Oh, it's about to. Yeah, oh. it's it's going to be two halves. It's volume one and two. Um, volume one really lays out the history of the clown costume and where we get it from. The history of the Nephilim, biblical, um, alternative biblical history from a contrarian viewpoint, which is where I come from. I'm a Christian contrarian. A lot of what I say is not really church Christianity. They wouldn't talk about these things, you know. But I, I try and explain the best I can the viewpoints from a conspiratorial perspective and a contrarian Christian perspective of the history of the Nephilim and demons in the book. And then the second half of this book is about the costume of a clown, the history of the Freemason connection and the secret society connection, uh, shamanism, um, D DMT jesters as well. So that lays the foundation for the spiritual aspect of all of this and the physical costume. Um, volume two, which will be published in about a year's time, uh, that is more into the ancestor spirit worship cult aspect of all of this. Uh, did you actually get any of that then? Or did it cut out? It did cut out okay. a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So the, volume two, um, once, obviously this is, volume one's been published in a couple of months, um, but volume two will take about a year to write and it's going to be a combined volumes in the end. One and two will be one book. But for now, I'm just splitting it into two. Um, but the second one will be about all the costumes worn by the ancestor spirit worship cultures through every continent. And then the second half of volume two is about all the modern stuff, the media, the film, the music industry, and all that, all that kind of stuff as well. So two volumes, two very distinct stories explaining the clown stuff. But uh, once it's finished, it's going to be about a 500-page doorstop about this thick from what I'm going for. But yeah. Wow. And where can we find... And where can we get your book? It'll be published on Amazon once it's ready. Um, I do have a GoFundMe currently activated for pre-orders, but I, I think I've capped out now about 80 pre-orders already, so I'm going to stop there. Um, but if you want to support the book, you can go to the GoFundMe. Any support will get you a special thank you in the book, unless you want to be anonymous. You can say you want to be anonymous as well. So it will get your name in the book if you're interested. You can go and support me there at GoFundMe. Just type in Nephilim Clown Book GoFundMe, and it will it will come up in any Google search yeah that's great any other things that you want to maybe close out with or say anything to anyone sure um though i'm talking about some pretty scary concepts here um ultimately these things are a defeated enemy okay and we do have authority over them in the name and the power of jesus christ these things flee in his name so there's nothing to fear here all I'm showing you is how the enemy works. I'm giving you some hints here to what to actually look for. In terms of a know your enemy situation, it's good to know what they actually look like. So at least you know what to look out for. So wherever you see the clown manifest in your waking life, what you're seeing there is the spirit realm bleeding into our realm through the people who are being influenced by them. Uh, so a very popular one right now, which is currently in the media, maybe we can close off this quite interesting topic, is demon face syndrome. And people have started to see humans with very wide smiles, warped faces, big bulging eyes. Um, I'll very quickly just share the screen here so you can see a screenshot of what I'm talking about. I, just, I have one on my desktop ready to go, so it's very quick. But uh, if I show you here on my desktop, uh, people have started to see faces like this and um it's 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 become a syndrome now it's now scientifically a real issue mental illness people get where when they look at somebody they see that image on the right instead okay and coincidentally it looks like a clown doesn't it you know and i think what's happening here is now people are starting to see through the veil a lot more and uh, people are starting to perceive the demons within humans. So I'm not saying this, this person is actually a demon, but what we can see now is the demon that's using them to feed off them, to parasitically use their senses for its own pleasure. And we're going to be, I think as time goes on, we may actually start seeing more people with this ability and more people expressing that they're seeing these things. Who knows? Maybe we'll all end up seeing this somehow, you know, because of some weird event or something. Who knows? But uh, now they've officially called it a syndrome, and if you speak out about it, you'll be considered mentally ill with a specific syndrome and probably put on medication, okay? But pr this, but this, this apparently this illness never existed until 2024 20, anyway. So, <laughs> but uh, just closing there, you know, the, the media's still pushing it. And yes, they do still look like clowns. 
But uh, no fear. If you do encounter anything like this, uh, call on Jesus and you'll be saved. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I enjoyed your your uh, presentation that you showed us today. It was amazing. Very convincing. Um, it's been really, truly a fascinating conversation. And I know the listeners will walk away with plenty to think about. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks for having me, Maya. <laughs> I really appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. And that brings us to an end of another episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast. I want to extend a huge thank you to my special guest, Paul Stubbs, for joining us and sharing his incredible and fascinating theories and insights. It's been an enlightening journey, and I hope it sparked curiosity and opened new avenues of thoughts in all of you. For those who've joined us on YouTube and Rumble, I hope the visuals added an extra layer to your understanding and enjoyment of this conversation. If you're listening through audio and you haven't checked out the visuals yet, I highly encourage you to visit either YouTube or Rumble to experience this full depth of today's conversation. Remember, the world is full of wonder waiting to be explored with an open mind and a keen eye. So keep questioning, keep seeking, and most importantly, stay sensible. Don't forget to subscribe Sensible Hippie Podcast on your favorite platform so you'll never miss an episode. Until the next time, beware the clown that smiles, not for joy, but for secrets hidden deep. Bye. Overhead a billion fires reflecting